This is Digital Pathology Today. Now, here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. I'm sure most of us are familiar with toxicologic pathology, but what exactly does a toxicologic pathologist do? And what is their role in drug development? What's the role of digital pathology in drug development studies? We've seen a massive shift or acceleration in the adoption of digital pathology amidst the global COVID-19 pandemic. Have these changes also affected drug discovery studies? And will artificial intelligence change the way we do things in drug discovery? Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. We're talking with Dr. Elizabeth Nyans, a toxicologic pathologist who offers services related to preclinical research, histopathologic evaluations, due diligence services, digital pathology, toxicology, as well as quality assurance expertise. This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by JAV Advisors. With over 16 years experience, JAV Advisors focuses on business and management consulting for digital pathology and artificial intelligence in deployment within histology, pathology, and cytology laboratories throughout the world. Call 213-258-6268 for more information. JAV Advisors. Dr. Elizabeth Nyans, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Now, today we're going to be talking about primarily toxicological pathology and its role in drug development and discovery. So first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, How did you get interested in this field? And this is focused on digital pathology, our podcast. So most important, uh, tell us about your experience in digital pathology. Sure. So my name is Elizabeth. I'm a trained DVM and veterinary toxicological pathologist and American board certified toxicologist. So that means that following my degree in veterinary medicine, I entered the pharmaceutical industry in order to um, contribute to the drug development. Mainly, we are looking at slides under a microscope, like everybody is used to this, but also with the new area, with the new revolution, we also want to try out, let's say, the digital pathology systems and implement them during the process of drug development. Okay, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I think, you know, we have a mixed audience and, you know, me and myself, I've, I've certainly aware of the work you folks do in in uh, drug development and discovery, but never really saw it for myself or never really met with any of the people involved. So I think this is uh, very exciting. So maybe could you tell us uh, what, what exactly you do in this role in toxicologic pathology and what is, and what is the role of DigPath in drug development studies? Sure, sure. Uh, When we are developing a new drug or let's say even a vaccine nowadays, it's important that you know a little bit more of the background of the process. So every researcher, every company needs to go through a specific pipeline which is approved by the FDA or the European regulatory authorities. So overall, it's always starting with a global R&D project. And from there, a preclinical path should be followed. Preclinical stands for non-clinical, and it's also called translational research. So the field is very narrowed. It's a very specific expertise. It's a kind of niche, let's say, because as pathologists, as toxicological pathologists, the, the goal of our job is to establish, to establish the lowest dose level of a drug through the evaluations of histopathology that may be inducing adversities in laboratory animals. Once we have established the no observed adverse effect level, you can extrapolate that to humans and they are going to build a first human trial, which is called the first in human. And I agree with you that there is often a lack of awareness of this specialization. As I said, the contribution we are asked is to conduct a kind of risk assessment that may arise during the course of a new drug development process. So in order to assess human risk, the toxicological pathologist, we should possess extensive knowledge in anatomy, in pathology, 
the physiology of several species, including non-human primates and even that of humans. So we are evaluating tissues and organs of lab animals and we assess these tissues through microscopic evaluations and we compare these to control animals. So you, you can guess already that we are trained as medical degree professionals with an additional training in anatomy, in, in uh, pathology, I mean. And we usually complete this with a certification in toxicology as well. So let's say that we observe, we identify and we interpret toxicological and pathological changes in preclinical studies. So that means that the workload or the slides, the number of slides that we are looking at during a casual day, let's say, it's around 200 slides. This means that we are looking at 50% of normal tissues and 50% of treated tissues or tissues coming from treated animals. Based on the differences, we make the conclusion if it is a drug which is safe for human in the future. So I expect that you're going to ask me the question how digital pathology could be implemented in toxicological pathology, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I think, but I think you said a lot, a lot there. So I think maybe give us first give us an idea of you know so what kind of changes are you looking for in the tissue is one question that comes into my mind and then secondly you know you said you're looking at often 200 cases a day or 200 glass slides a day so for those of us who may not be as familiar with with what you do is that a lot you know are, are folks you know, taxed or at their, at their breaking point? Do they have the capacity for to take on more work? When you enter the discipline of toxic pathology, you're a junior and you need to build your knowledge. I suppose this is in every discipline of medicine like this. So we are looking at all tissues of one lab animal. These tissues are established by the FDA and by regulators. So the environment in which we are working, it's a very regulatory environment. There is no opportunity to create, to think, I would say, because we need to follow each guideline. If we do not follow the guideline, that's for sure, that's okay but we need to report and we need to document. That's the golden standard in Toxpad. Document, document, document. So in order to answer your question, which lesions we are looking at, I would say we need to be aware or we need to be prepared to see each type of lesion. This can be coming from an inflammatory process. It can be a degenerative change or it could be neoplastic changes. Overall, I must say that in toxic pathology, the changes are small because we are not looking at diseases anymore. I was trained in diagnostics. I was trained to diagnose diseases, but in toxic pathology, the purpose of the game, I would say, is to identify, is to diagnose the pre neoplastic lesions or the lesions that will occur before it's irreversible. So therefore, we are looking, as I said, at all tissues and we need to compare this with normal background lesions because each animal is different, right? So each pathophysiology needs to be compared to the normal changes in a normal animal. And I must say that this can be very labor intense because tissues may, you may expect a lot of changes. The question for a toxic pathologist is, is the change that I see, is the diagnosis relevant? And if it's relevant, is it adverse? Would it harm humans in a clinical trial. So it sounds like there's a lot of difficult decisions to be made and 
there's a high degree of attention to detail. Absolutely. So I think this is very interesting. So I think I, I think as we'll get to, I'm hoping, it seems like that approach might lend itself to artificial intelligence applications, because certainly there's things that are, you know, very difficult for human beings to do, or human beings could be aided or assisted by new technology, such as in looking for very subtle things, comparing a lesion from specimen A to specimen B, and so forth. So it sounds to me, I suspect there's going to be some opportunity for artificial intelligence applications. Uh, but before we get there, let's just talk about digital pathology in general. So what? So you said this is a highly regulated environment. What What is the, the role of digital pathology, or what is the current status? You know, are these images digitized right now? And is there plans to do more? Where do we stand? Yeah, it's wonderful. I really like to talk about digital pathology in a drug development setting. So many years ago, when I started my uh, career in a contract research lab, we were looking at slides under the microscope, but we were already scanning slides. That means we had already whole slide imaging files to share with with, with my colleagues and also share with my sponsors. Now, as you mentioned, we are in a regulatory environment. So let's say that there are two kind of working environments. You have the GLP environment, which is the good laboratory practice, and you have the non-GLP environment. Both environments are identical. However, we need to document everything if you're in a GLP setting. So when the digital pathology revolution came in, it made a lot of people completely stressed out because everything had to be documented. So we started the digital pathology within a non-GLP environment. So this gives us the it gave us the opportunity to not to play, but to try out without that kind of mandatory document behind us each second, I would say. So we felt comfortable to scan slides. We felt comfortable to archive the whole slide images. And we were even more comfortable to show slides with our sponsors and to discuss. However, the goal, the rule remained, we should never diagnose a disease or a change on a digital slide because we are still in a non-GLP setting. But time changed and people wanted to go further. They wanted to do digital pathology within GLP environments because finally when you're submitting, submitting a drug development file to the FDA, you will need to submit GLP studies, what we say. So we, we, we decided to think about the quality assurance, about the validation processes of digital pathology and how we as toxic pathologists, we can prove to the FDA that digital pathology is non-inferior to the microscope. So let's say we need to prove that what we see under the microscope is exactly what we see on the screen. I see. Uh, so in a highly regulated environment, I think there's always going to be those kinds of challenges, you know, where you have to do, you know, you have a new technology and it's clear there's going to be benefits to adopt it, but how do you get the regulatory approvals to do so? So is there a well thought out pathway or do we have to kind of make this stuff up as we go along? No, we are working in close collaborations with regulators and with FDA. So let's say there's already a lot of work which has been achieved in a very productive manner. So we have already the different steps on paper, in guidelines, what we should achieve and how we should validate the systems. Uh, what we will uh, need to manage is that 
sides may be different. So not everyone will be aligned within the same workflow because digital workflows, they can vary from side to side. So I think what's the most important thing today is to continue to harmonize the process of digital pathology because as digital pathologists we not only diagnose but we also doing peer reviews so that means that in order to submit a file to the FDA each diagnosis or a certain percentage of our diagnosis it's a peer-reviewed process by our boss or by our department or by our sponsor, pharmaceutical companies. So the peer review process will be digitalized very soon as well. And we hope we can digitalize the peer review within a GLP manner. So let's say that I think that's a personal opinion, more than 50% has been achieved already. And I think with the pandemic, with what's happening to us today, I think it will be a very smooth, quick process to, to, to add the, 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 the mandatory steps to, to have that workflow fully validated within a GLP environment. This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by DJT Solutions, your single source for all your digital pathology requirements, from consultation services to system requirements, including installation, training, and life cycle support. Since 1995, DJT Solutions, we are your best choice for your best results. I think that's very interesting, uh, this aspect of the pandemic, because I think often that's how things happen, right? They're in the works for some time, and there's hurdles to overcome, a lot of times regulatory barriers, but then something happens, something cataclysmic or a, a massive catalyst. And I think we saw that in the practice of clinical pathology in the U.S. and worldwide. So how has uh, COVID-19 changed the way uh, you've been doing things in recent months and changed, uh, you know, this road to dig digitization. Yes, yes. I think the pandemic prompted a major shif shift in our professional network. Honestly, from my side, I wasn't expecting a sudden increase in the amount of digital pathology and translational consultations. I suppose that, as you said, we had no other options, Right. So a lot of things happens during this, these strange times, I would say. So I think it's very gratifying what happens in the way that digital pathology had time to, 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 to speed up a little bit and all our conferences became virtual. In my opinion, I gained five years of experience in less than six months so, and I think this is something a lot of my colleagues are experiencing as well. So I hope really that all the work that has been achieved during this kind of isolation between pathologists, that it will be very quickly implemented and it will be productive for the future in order to to increase only to increase the the digital interactions between pathologists yeah yeah I, I think you're right i think times of times of grief and trouble can really bring out the best in us a lot of times so now let's get back to artificial intelligence you know i think in my mind there's certainly things that you know machine learning more automated approaches and ai can can handle better than better than human beings so is, is this an accurate view and 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 how does this fit into the work that you do i think the artificial intelligence will not cut off our jobs because this is a question i often receive aren't you afraid that the artificial intelligence you will you know drug development can be done without any pathologist i don't think so i think the the artificial intelligence, and I've seen already a few tools, they are so great to help us because 
can you imagine we are looking at 200 slides a day, but finally 50% of these slides are normal tissues, right? So if, if artificial intelligence could help us a little bit to screen already the major changes, the major relevant changes in a tissue, in, a, in an animal, in a lab animal, this would allow us to, to, to make more diagnosis in a more efficient way uh, without, you know, let's say we can make mistakes as well. And I think there the artificial intelligence will help us for sure to, to speed up a little bit and maybe to improve our working flow. Now, I've seen the, a few tools and I think each organ will be a different story, right? Uh, if I'm yeah, evaluating the eye, the ocular globe, it's not the same exercise as diagnosing changes in the liver. I've seen artificial intelligence in kidneys. I've seen it already in brain. And I think it's wonderful to see that artificial intelligence provides you with a kind of map. It's not with diagnosis, but it will give you a kind of map with different colors. You know, when it's red, there is an increased probability or something is going wrong in that kind, in that space or in that area of the liver where green areas seems to be quite normal when the algorithm has been established to recognize it for a liver. However, as I said, each animal is different. So you cannot train an algorithm to diagnose all the options, but you can train the algorithm to diagnose maybe inflammation or a hyperplasy of the bile duct or even neoplasia. I think adenomas, carcinomas, maybe you can train them, but I'm still convinced that pathologists will need to keep an eye on the algorithm. First, they need to develop the algorithm. I don't think you can develop an algorithm without a pathologist trained in toxicological pathology. And then once the algorithm has been established, I suppose, because we are in a GLP environment, you will need to validate the algorithm and then you will need also to accept that the algorithm will not be perfect. But I think if you can increase the number of slides in the algorithm, you may have more time to do precise diagnosis. Sounds like human beings, the human being pathologists are not going anywhere for a while at least. And this is potentially going to be opening up even more opportunities and a chance to us, a chance for us to do our jobs even even better and to add even more value. Uh, so plenty of opportunities, but what about challenges? Are there challenges that we're facing, I guess, first in general, in implementing uh, digital workflows? And then secondly, in implementing AI and developing these types of algorithms? Digital pathology and tox pathology, I would say, we are not the only one anymore who are playing. We are pathologists, but we cannot do the job anymore just between pathologists. It's too complex. We need, I would say, IT people. We need people who are specialists in quality assurance. And we need, of course, the regulators with us as well. We need to explain them because how should the regulator review our workflows if they never heard about it? So the challenges, I would say, I like quality assurance. I'm a GLP uh, pathologist. So I think quality assurance is top priority. You need to prove that the quality is not inferior. So I think also that the main challenge or what FDA is asking us is, are you really looking at the same thing on your screen than under your microscope? Can you diagnose everything? Is there anything else that you may miss? Because that's, that's the, the big anxiety from an FDA. Please don't miss any changes. So a lot of publications has been done already on that kind of subject. And I think we are going in a good direction by saying that 
Yes, there are lesions that will be difficult to, to see or to diagnose only with digital pathology. It's not the most common lesion, but they may exist. And we need to be aware that sometimes we, need, we still need the microscope. So when we are discussing what you see under the microscope is what you see on the screen, we are in fact discussing what type of monitor are you looking at? What type of color calibration? What is the refresh rate of your monitor? What's your uh, internet brand? Uh, where is your server? When you're going to save a whole slide image, are you going to, to put a version 1, 2, 3, up to 10? And do you have enough space to, to, to archive all these files? Because as maybe I didn't mention, once you're in a GLP environment, you cannot discard anything anymore. You need to archive. You need to archive for at least 15, 20 years. So this is a huge server, I would say, you really need. So I think the challenge is IT and the challenge is the quality assurance. But Again, a lot of progress has been made. I see that is that is a lot to take into account, and I think these conversations with regulators I'm finding are increasingly fascinating. I think it's tempting to think of regulation as kind of a, a nuisance or a bad word or a necessary evil, but what I'm learning is it can actually provide a framework, and developing these relationships and dialogues with regulators can actually help us push the field forward. What's been your experience? As a pathologist, I developed digital. I, I developed my digital pathology skills a few years ago. So I started to look for a certification course because I think the first thing I need to prove is that I'm not only a pathologist, but I know a little bit how it works. So uh, together with a few professional associations, I certified in a digital pathology program. And I think that's important that you can show to the regulators as well that you have some background, not only about pathology, but also about IT, about workflows, about exchange files, etc. So the framework is wonderful today with the regulators because we have a lot of productive communications and meetings. And one conclusion of these regulatory meetings is that, and I really appreciate that, is that the final responsibility, it's still the pathologist. If the pathologist says, I cannot make the diagnosis with this digital screen or with di digital slide. I think that's, that's the final sentence or the trigger that the pathologist needs his microscope. As you know, you can scan slides. You can scan slides at different magnifications. The, the higher magnification you're going to scan, the better pixel you will get, right? So, but the higher memory or the higher bytes, terabytes, you will need to, to, to reserve for that kind of project. So I think that regulatory framework, it's very important. And I really appreciate that they told us the final responsibility will remain with the pathologist because finally, we as pathologists, we are trained to recognize tissues and cells. And another remark I had a few weeks ago is that, and that's also true, when I started to, to, to study pathology, my textbooks, they were in white and black, right? So we were able to diagnose a carcinoma because it was in my textbook and, and, and we had no colors or at least not everything was colored in green and red and HNE stain like we are used to. So I think finally maybe we shouldn't bother or uh, be anxious too much about that monitor and that color calibration because maybe we are able to diagnose in black and white, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, that, that's fascinating. There certainly is a lot of rich information locked in there, color being one of them. But it is interesting how yeah, many of us have trained in the in the old days, and and color wasn't necessarily a consideration. I do remember those black and white textbooks as well. So you personally, you've worked all over the world with and had a variety of experiences with various uh, partners. So tell us a little bit about that. And, and how do you see digital pathology facilitating a truly gr- global approach? Yes, I think we have a most beautiful job on earth, I would say, as digital pathologists. But we need to see a lot. That means that we need to get exposed. We are trained in diagnostic in diagnostics. We are trained in all kinds of diseases, bacteria, viruses, whatever you would like to see. But drug development is being exposed to potential changes related to compounds. And if you want to be good toxicological pathologist, you need to get exposure. The job of a pathologist is not only to diagnose. I think everybody can see an inflammation. Everybody can see that it's a carcinoma. The question is, is that carcinoma relevant to that compound? And is that inflammation relevant to that kind of animal, lab animal? And the question here is how you get all this knowledge, how you get to see all these images under your microscope. And there is only one thing is that you need to read slides and you need to to be in a setting where you see a lot of drugs coming and also medical devices, because we do not need to forget that medical devices is also important in drug development. So my first choice was going into a contract research organization, and my preference was the biggest one, because there you see the biggest changes and the largest uh, classifications of compounds. And there I've done my job or I've learned the job and I started with small studies with a few animals and I ended up with a study which is called carcinogenicity studies where you can go up to 40,000 slides and you still need consistency in a short period of time. So I think this, uh, I was quite occupied by learning this during the five or six, seven years. After these years, I thought it was also important to have some exposure to management and leadership within preclinical drug development. But this is something you will not have in a contract research organization. This is something you will need to get into a pharmaceutical company where you only see one or two compounds, but you will be able to develop these compounds through a kind of uh, drug development process. So this is the reason why I changed from a CRO to a pharmaceutical industry. So I love that kind of job because there you may interact with uh, all kind of partners, not only, you know, CROs, but also regulators and uh, companies and, and, and all stakeholders involved in drug development. And then these jobs are not so easily available or if they are available, you will need to travel. You will need to be open to travel and to change your environment. So it's a little bit a kind of classical path for a toxicological pathology. Today, I decided to be a consultant because I like to settle a little bit more, but I could never be a consultant if I had not accomplished my early career into CRO and pharmaceutical companies. Well, Dr. Elizabeth Nyans, thank you so much for being with us. Now, before we wrap up, I'm uh, just wondering, do you have any advice for new trainees? And what excites you about the field in the next couple of years? I think uh, a lot of people are ready to, to try out digital pathology and tox paths. And I think uh, a lot of trainees they want to see this now in their curriculum. 
So uh, professional societies are working on this to implement this new skill, if we may say, into this for these new trainees. And my advice to these new trainees, I would say, is just go for it. Don't wait that it's perfect. Don't wait that you feel comfortable within a GLP environment. Just give it a try in an academic setting or give it a try in a non-GLP setting. Try to learn from your peers. Go out to read a little bit more about digital pathology and Unfortunately, you will need to be open to technologies. You will need to try to understand IT and server and clouds and a scanner. But we are not expected to be IT experts, right? We are pathologists. But if we want to have that kind of perfect image on our screen, we need to communicate with our stakeholders. We need to tell them what we would like to have. And I think our job is to establish efficient communication today as well. Well, that's wonderful. Our guest has been Dr. Elizabeth Nyans. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.